God's grace, mercy, and peace be multiplied unto you through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Our text for this morning is the gospel lesson, which Sue read earlier. It too has to do about um, speaking. Jeremiah was not only nervous and unwilling, that's you and me sometimes, to testify to God's wonderful work in our lives, which indeed is calling us to be his children, bringing us into his family through baptism, keeping us in his family, keeping our hope alive, our hope of eternal life through the preaching of the word and uh, the, uh, the reception of the Lord's Supper until we close our eyes only to wake up in heaven. And he didn't want to do that. So he was not only nervous and unwilling, he found excuses. And when he preached, you'd think it probably wasn't very forceful. But the text that we're going to talk about today is someone else who preached, and he preached with great power and effect, and effect. Um, I call it causative power. Let me give you an illustration. With the playoff season here now in football, anybody follow football? Don't say no, say yes. Okay. <laughs> it's everywhere. <laughs> It amazes me how uh, strong and athletic these uh, the punters are. They get a snap from the from the center and they kick the ball 40 or 50 yards downfield. It just sails, and the kickoffs are like they kick, sometimes they kick them out of the stadium. I call that p causative power. Causative power. Let me give you another example. Um, money. Money has causative power. When you were a kid and you went into the drugstore or whatever, you had a quarter. You had to borrow that, okay? And you couldn't buy very much. Now you have $20 and you can't buy very much. Teasing. If you have money in your pocket, it has power. You have economic power. Let me give you another example or two. They say the President of the United States, really his only power is the power of persuasion. He can't make laws. I guess he could submit ideas for laws, but his only power to lead the country in the direction he envisions it should go is to persuade you and I. So a president has to be a good speaker, and if he wants power to take effect, he has to have a tremendous ability to persuade, to make it causative. I don't think I have any power. I don't think I have any power. Our kids are growing up. I discovered if I say the opposite thing of what I want them to do, they would do it. So I say, hey, go ahead, yeah, tie one on this Friday night. Huh? Go do drugs and speed limit and stay out to whenever you want. It worked. It worked better than if I said, okay, no, sm no smoking, get away the cigarettes, no drinking, be in on the time. They, that wasn't causative. But if I used reverse psychology, Sometimes it would work. Somebody said to me around Christmas time when the parades were going on, you know, Pastor, I think grace should have a float in the parade. Grace should have a float in the parade. I said, that's a good idea, but don't ask me to say it's the kiss of death. It has to come from you, and then people will listen. I found that true. I found that true. As a pastor, the, as a pastor sometimes I get discouraged because I preach the word. Remember when I said a couple weeks ago, the word is in the word? So I use words to get to the word, our text for today, and in the word we find the word. But sometimes I don't think I'm very effective. That's why I ask my wife, Jane, every Saturday afternoon, I start, please pray for the preacher. I ask you the same too, that the power of of the words that come out of my mouth and the Jesus that is presented in my words is causative. It has impact. Yes, Jesus had causative power. When he left Nazareth and went to Capernaum, still in Galilee, he preached at many synagogues, our text says today in Luke chapter 4. And one of these synagogues he went in, he ran into a parishioner who had um, an attender, I don't know, uh, uh, an attender 
who had a, a, a bad spirit, a demon spirit. I don't know how I would handle that. I don't know how I would handle that. I don't think there would be any words that would help me solve that problem. I know soft, gentle words would probably be the best. But Jesus rebukes the demon, and the demon comes out of him. Jesus had power that worked. And then later on in the day, he goes to his disciples Peter's house, where his mother-in-law sounds like she's laying near death, lying near death. And she goes, he goes upstairs, and his power restores her to health. Not semi-health, but full health. Has that ever happened to you? You go to the doctor, and they do a little bit for you, <clears throat> but you find out you're really not getting any better. Jesus' power was so effective that this woman not only got up, she didn't have to convalesce, she got up, and she prepared a meal for him. She was completely well. And that same evening, people in Capernaum brought their sick ones, and Jesus' power healed them, healed them. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we had Jesus' causative power right here, right now? The answer is we do, because Jesus is in the Word. Jesus is in the confession and absolution. Jesus is in your baptismal waters dried off so many years ago, but still effective. Jesus is in the bread and the wine, and his word and his power heals you. Starting with our bigness, biggest illness, the cancer, the leprosy of sin. I stand up here every Sunday morning, sometimes other times, and I forgive you your sins. But that's not actually correct. Jesus forgives you your sins. The pastor, by virtue of his office, is not Gary. Hmm? It's not my powers of persuasion. It's because Jesus has created an office, it's called the church, through whom the public ministers, uh, through the public ministers, through the church, you give it to me, instead of everybody up here forgiving the sins, you give me the office of the keys, and through me, through that office, Jesus' causative power lifts from you the terminal disease, the cancer of sin, and replaces it with wholeness, with peace, with life, and with the promise of eternal life. Jesus' power does that. Jesus is present in the Word and in the sacraments. In the Old Testament, <clears throat> when good things happen, and when good things were talked about, the lame walking, the blind seeing, the lepers being whole, brokenness being restored, death being conquered, they thought of it in terms of the end of the age. When Jesus did it in the first century, and when he does it now, gives us the same thing, victory over death, forgiveness of sins, hope, and life, it's like the good stuff coming early. It's called the kingdom of God. I learned this this week, that when the word kingdom is used in the Bible, it doesn't mean, you know, like Disneyland, huh? kingdom, Sleeping Beauty's castle, a certain portion of the park, or although monarchies are kind of out, a certain area, hmm, uh, Britain is a kingdom, it means an activity. When there is forgiveness and hope and life and access to Jesus for physical health as well, that's something we should talk about. Jesus not only gives us Spiritual health, you can be assured of that. He gives you access to his power and his benevolence to give you physical health. So when you go to the doctor, invite Jesus to go with you. When you lay awake at night thinking about your mortality, invite Jesus to be there with you. When your child is sick or your 
you have some other um, burden, invite Jesus into that. Invite him and ask for his causative power in your physical ailments as well. Remember the movie Back to the Future? Back to the Future starred Marty, Marty the young man, and Doc Brown. Remember that? And Marty goes back, back in history to before his parents met, hmm, before they were married, and before they had him to make some changes so that when he came around, his life would be better. And Doc Brown would help him. And I like what Doc Brown always said when something marvelous happened. He would say, great Scott, great Scott. They brought the future into the past, or better said, they went back to the past to make the future better. Jesus does that. Jesus did that in the first century because he spoke with authority. He wasn't nervous or unwilling like Jeremiah, like pastors, like lay people. He brought into reality early on a wonderful life of light and hope. There's so much depression out there. There's so much, oh my good heavens, watch the campaigning. Will it ever end? The answer is no. The, the bickering and the way people talk to each other. Jesus brings in a different kind of life, a different kind of world, a different kind of realm within you and within me. He did it in the first century. He does it now through the feeble words that I speak, and he does it when we get to the altar. Hmm. And I'll do it again at end time. Because once again, he opens his mouth and he speaks and he makes a promise. I shall return. And when I shall return, I'll bring you into the fullness of the basileia, the U, the kingdom of God. Heaven will be a wonderful, wonderful place where all kinds of wonderful things are happening even as they begin to do now, even as he begins to do now. So hear Jesus this morning. He is available to you. He's preaching to you. He's telling you your sins are forgiven. He's telling you death is a piece of cake. It's like a Sunday afternoon nap. He's telling you there is an eternal life of happiness apart from this broken, sin-stained world. You can have part of it now and walk with me, take that Sunday afternoon nap, and wake up to the wonderful glories of heaven. Like Doc Brown would say, Great Scott! Amen. And his joy and peace and confidence be and abide with you now and forever. Amen.